Ministry of Equality would like to welcome you all to what promises to be a very enlightening evening and an emotional journey. I will now call upon uh, the Honorable Samantha Sacramento, Minister for Equality, to open the evening of talks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us to what is really a privilege and an honor to share this evening with, with Arik Hirsch, a Holocaust survivor. Tonight, you will truly enjoy what is an exceptional opportunity for someone to take us through his journey of, of his atrocities during one of the worst periods, I think, of, of living history and, and of living memory. I feel very invested in this because I was invited by the Learning from Auschwitz charity to attend the trip that they organize um, to the concentration camps. In fact, they invite me every year, but because it always clashes with our um, budget session in Parliament, I'm never able to, to attend, but this year, I did have the opportunity to go, and I have been through this journey with everyone who attends, and I feel very privileged to have done so because it has touched me and it has touched everybody who was there because going through this and, and being there is not only extremely um, emotional and touching, but it's also very humbling. Not only did we have the opportunity of, of going through this experience with, that is organized by, by the charity for the, for the school pupils, but we also had that added bonus to be prepared for the journey by Mike Levy, who is a, a specialist Holocaust educationalist, and I think the absolute honor to be taken through the journey with Arag. Arag gave us his personal recollection of what it was like of him being in the concentration camps as a child and and what he and his family went through and it's a real exceptional privilege to have him here in Gibraltar tonight and that's why I felt so strongly I immediately after the visit in July I immediately invited Arag to Gibraltar because there are not that many Holocaust survivors left in the world and I wanted to make sure that in Gibraltar everybody had the opportunity of, of hearing his direct experience of, of what happened. And I also think that it's very important that we all, we obviously all know about the Holocaust, but that we learn from it properly for various reasons. I have also arranged for, for Mike Levy to not only speak to the children in our schools and teach them about the Holocaust, but that he also work with our teachers in the schools locally to ensure that our teachers teach the Holocaust properly. Because the Holocaust is um, a huge <coughs> tragedy that happened very, very recently, if we think about it. And unfortunately, these atrocities continue to happen. And I think we all have to learn. We have to acknowledge that it happened, and we also have to learn lessons because we all have to contribute in what we can to make sure that we, uh, we eradicate hatred, we erad eradicate discrimination, we eradicate racism so that these atrocities do not happen again. And I think that we all have an individual and a collective responsibility towards this. So tonight will be a very emotional journey. I can't say that we will enjoy it, but I think that it's something that we have to hear and something that we have to listen to. So thank you everybody for being here. In fact, I'm delighted that this event was actually oversubscribed. It shows how important it is for us as a community. So thank you very much. Good evening, ministers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the charity Learning from Auschwitz was formed in 2010 65 years after the Auschwitz concentration camp was liberated. The charity is run by five local trustees, myself, Isabella Shepard Capurro, Mandy Gallero, Vivian Canessa, and Nikki Guerrero. 
Based on the premise that hearing is not like seeing, everywhere, every year we take students of all religious, social and cultural backgrounds on an educational trip to Poland. During this trip, students visit Auschwitz-Birkenau, <coughs> attend seminars given by Mr. Mike Levy, who you will hear later on, meet Mr. Eric Hirsch, who is a Holocaust survivor, and you will have the honor and pleasure of hearing him later on tonight. On their return from the trip, the students are obliged to create a project to show the community what they have learned when they've come on this trip to Poland. In this way, they cascade their education and their experience to others in the community. This evening, we are fortunate to have two of the students who will give a little bit of what they did in their presentation a couple of weeks ago. You'll hear from them later. The vision and focus of the Learning from Auschwitz charity is one, to teach lessons of the Holocaust in order to learn lessons for the future, to motivate future generations not to stand by, but to speak out against racism and prejudice, and to inspire individuals to consider their responsibilities within our society. We are all very fortunate to live in Gibraltar, where acceptance of difference and diversity is part of our DNA, where we live in harmony, side by side, respecting each other's beliefs, customs and traditions, and no matter what one's religion, culture or social standing. However, we must keep working together to ensure this harmony and peace continues. We feel the work undertaken by our charity is essential for curbing racism and educating the younger generation about its potential effects on humanity when this goes unchallenged or unchecked. There are very important lessons to learn from the past. We as a charity cannot do this work without our sponsors. I therefore want to take this opportunity to thank you all, the Parasol Foundation, Her Majesty's Government of Gibraltar, Finsbury Trust, Clarasol Investments, Hassan's, Hyperion Group, SM Seruya, Castiel Windsor, Kleinwood Hambros, Logistables, Mr. Raphael Benaim, Deloitte, and Jiboyle, and a couple of sponsors who happen to be sitting in the auditorium tonight and wish to remain anonymous, but you know who you are. I take this opportunity to ask anyone in the public if you're interested in sponsoring us, you can approach us after this event. And a final thank you to all head teachers and teachers of our senior schools for their continued support. Thank you to Minister Sacramento, who having accompanied us to Poland in July, saw our work and decided to extend this by bringing an educator and survivor to Gibraltar. Thank you for organizing this event and giving our community the privilege and opportunity of hearing these very interesting and wonderful speakers. Thank you all for coming tonight. And it is my pleasure now to introduce you to two of the students who came with us and they're going to give you just a very little bit of what they presented at the presentation. Mel Trinidad and Jiron Askes, please. Good evening all. After much reflection, I decided that it was my duty to speak for the voices that have been denied. The trip has changed my life in many ways. I generally am more grateful and want to share my thoughts from the Learning from Auschwitz trip with you. We find that between the past and the future, there is an extremely thin line, something that cannot really withstand analysis. Past and future exist in relation to the present. Throughout history, suffering originates from various causes and conditions, but the root cause of our pain and suffering lies in our own selves. Ignorant, evil people, or simply the many bystanders are the reasons the world has suffered and will suffer. We are all capable of causing evil doings, but humanity has also shown us that if we emphasize wisdom and compassion in our daily lives, we will encounter the suffering of others, other beings, again and again, but we will have the capacity to acknowledge it, 
respond to it and feel deep compassion rather than empathy or impotence. It is with deep compassion that the inner evils of every individual begins to dissolve and are left with inner peace and a world where the innocent no longer suffer, where humans, no matter what race, faith, gender or sexuality, are merely humans in which we will love for just sharing the present moment. We who have visited the camps have a duty due to this experience and enlightenment to bring the truth about hatred to those who have not directly experienced it. We are the light at the end of the tip. We are the light at the tip of the candle. It is capable of causing pain, but we must choose to use its power to shine and illuminate compassion and love. The message I want you to take from this speech is that we all have the power to love, be compassionate, and to stand up to any form of discrimination, no matter where it takes place, be it in a school or in the workplace, you have the duty to stop hate at that level, as it prevents things like the Holocaust from happening again. Thank you. Good evening all. Um, this poem is entitled Discrimination, and it goes something like this. Imagine the life you currently own being stripped away so quick. Yesterday family and now alone, caused by an ideology so sick. It all began for being different and not fitting into a mold. Grew into hatred towards the, in the, the innocent and to those who did not do as they were told. The victims were taken away by the masses, men, women and children alike, wishing and praying as the day passes, the hope they seek to strike. Laughter and joy between one another transformed into tears and dread. Six years of war during the winter and summer resulted in six million Jews dead. Almost a century in and some progress has been made. However, discrimination is still at hand and a trend we must try to fade. We must never forget this horrific event as millions of lives were lost. Innocent children never learnt what it meant to live a life at no cost. As a society, we must now face to treat others with dignity and respect, no matter the sorry, uh, no matter the gender, sexuality, or race, no matter no matter how rude or correct. The problem with fighting fire with fire is that everybody ends up burnt. Thus, using peaceful methods will inspire and prove that some lessons were learnt. Together, we must help and rise and wish us all good health, because if we can all become wise, we can stop history repeating itself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Mike Levy. Um, I'm a Holocaust educator. Um, I, I came to Gibraltar partly hoping to get rid of this uh, cold and uh, sore throat. Uh, so I do apologize for the croakiness. I don't normally speak like this, but I'll do my best to make myself heard. Um, thank you, everyone, for inviting us, ministers, uh, uh, learning from Auschwitz staff. Um, everyone in Gibraltar has been so wonderful and kind. Uh, and we just had, of course, two um, brilliant pieces of writing, creative work from two of the students who came with us to, uh, to Krakow and to Auschwitz. Um, and I can say, as someone that goes relatively often, that uh, their input was absolutely remarkable. And the young people who go, I think, to Auschwitz from here um, with learning from Auschwitz, these are people that you as, um, uh, as Gibraltar and Gibraltarians can be extremely proud. Um, they say things like, it's an honor to go with Mike and to, with Eric, uh, who's sitting here, uh, to Auschwitz. But let me tell you, it's a huge honor to go with intelligent and, and young people who feel um, incredibly moved to do something to make the world a better place and it gives us all a huge amount of hope. So thank you to you two as well. So um, I'm here really to give a bit of a background to Eric's uh, talk which he's going to give um, in, in a few moments. Uh, some of the historical background about the Holocaust and how it happened and what happened and give some kind of context I guess to um, Eric's own story that you'll hear and I'm not going to <coughs> preempt uh, in any way. Um, a few years ago a friend of mine, actually I should say an ex-friend of mine, uh, said why do you keep banging on about the Holocaust? Isn't it just a horror story? 
that we've heard too much about. Uh, it's one of the reasons why he's now an ex-friend uh, <laughs> of mine. Uh, and it, but he did make me think that maybe a lot of people out there are uh, reluctant to face up to the history of the Holocaust era because they think it's some kind of horror story. I would contend that it's not a horror story. Uh, a horror story is something that we <coughs> think of as a, st as a fairy tale, something perhaps in our darkest imaginations that we, we believe could never really happen. Uh, the Holocaust isn't that kind of story because the Holocaust is something that really did happen. It wasn't fairy tale. And even more importantly, unlike horror stories, which are made up of creative, fantastic characters, I've got some really bad news for you. The Holocaust is actually a human story. It's a human story which, can the next slide please? It's a human story uh, involving ordinary human beings. When I was a lad uh, brought up in, North, in Yorkshire, in, in Leeds, you probably can hear it from my accent, it comes out the more I speak, I get a bit less posh and the, the Yorkshire comes out. Uh, I, a little Jewish boy, and I asked my mum what the Holocaust was all about, this was the late 50s, and she told me that, uh, well, it was a bunch of evil monsters who um, were all slightly mad and insane and, you know, they weren't real humans. And as I suppose as a six-year-old, there was something uh, that was deeply comforting uh, in that story. It's only later you realize even more horrifically that the people who carried out the Holocaust, uh, just as the people who suffered from it, uh, were all too human. So it very much is a human story. Um, I, I've learned over the years as a teacher uh, never to underestimate uh, the, the um, levels, not here of course, but levels of um, ignorance generally out there in, in the wider world about what the Holocaust actually is, what it means, and what it was. Uh, it, vaguely people know it was something bad that happened maybe in Germany or something to do with Hitler or whatever. So um, I'm going to go through uh, not exactly a definition but some of the key points to what I think it, it tells us a bit more about the Holocaust. And um, if we cover the next, next bullet point please. Um, as you can see, um, we can start defining the Holocaust in terms of when it happened. It was under the cover of the Second World War. It was an attempt by Nazi Germany, <laughs> a democratically actually elected government in 1933, uh, and its allies, very important, Germany wasn't the only player in this, to murder all the Jews of Europe. So that's it, starkly, as a definition. But next bullet point, please. Of Europe's 11 million Jews, uh, 6 million of them were murdered. So the Nazis got over halfway through um, their intended policy of murdering all of Europe's uh, Jewish population, men, women, and children. And that takes me to the next bullet, please, where horrifically we discover that of the 6 million who were murdered in the Holocaust, uh, 1.5 million uh, of them were children. To say that they were innocent children is, of course, true, but then all six million were completely innocent as well. So we have to ask this question. It's an uncomfortable question. I say this to students as well. How can innocent people on that scale be murdered by human beings who are not mad, who were not um, evil monsters, but were human beings? And it's tough. It's a very tough thing to do. It's a very tough question to ask. Can we go to the next one, please? How do we know? Well, we know there are 11 million Jews uh, being targeted by the Germans because here is the figure, 11 million. Can you all see the numbers? This is a sheet of paper that was rescued from a conference in Berlin called the Wannsee Conference. It took place in January of 1942, and it was, uh, it was attended by very senior Nazi officials. Um, Reinhard Heydrich was the chair of the um, committee. And the first question they wanted to know, these Nazi uh, seniors, were how many Jews are there in Europe and where are they? Um, and as you can see, um, uh, the total is 11 million, and every country in Europe pretty much is listed, and the number of Jews in, th in those countries. This was not just some kind of statistical uh, analysis 
that Heydrich and Eichmann and others wanted to know. This was the beginning of a blueprint, and the blueprint was to know how many Jews were in each country, and therefore how can we plan for the murder of all of those Jews in each of those countries. <coughs> there would be some countries that would be let off from this, uh, neutral countries such as Spain, because they were not in involved in the Second World War. Um, but there were other countries, many, many countries, that would be occupied under wartime conditions. So a chilling piece of paper which shows the kind of length to which the Holocaust was a highly planned activity by a bunch of very intelligent people. Uh, in fact, if uh, I say to you that around that table were something like 20, 25 senior Nazi officials, 23 of them had PhDs. So these are not some lunatic people who didn't know what they were doing. These are highly intelligent people. Next slide, please. Something else that I often uh, pose to young people and to audiences like this is, is the Holocaust something that was long ago and far away? To quote that old Rogers and Hart song. I can't sing it, I'm afraid. Um, well, it was certainly long ago, but not so long ago that there aren't eyewitnesses uh, to this event. And of course, we're going to hear from a, an eyewitness in a moment. Was it far away? You may think sitting here at the southern tip of Europe uh, in Gibraltar that uh, the Holocaust didn't reach out, its tentacles didn't reach this far. But it was such a gigantic operation, um, such a complex web of interconnecting policies and actions that it did in fact get this far as well. Next slide, please. You all probably know the Sikorsky Memorial at, is it called Europa Point on the southern tip uh, here? I'm very interested in this because uh, I've been doing some research on Sikorsky and the role of the Polish army. Uh, and so I went to see it when I was here last year. <laughs> but actually, something I didn't know, uh, reading the list of victims of that air crash that killed Sikorsky, who was the leader of the Polish Free Army, uh, was a, a British MP called Victor Cazalet. And there he is. Uh, he'd been a First World War um, hero uh, with the military, military cross and so on. But more importantly to our story, he's a very small player in a very gigantic story. Uh, Cazalet was a member of parliament during the <laughs> 1930s. Um, and he's one of the very, very few members of parliament who knew what the Nazis were up to and warned, did his best to warn his fellow parliamentarians that something drastic had to be done to save the Jews of Europe. We're talking about before the war now, before the Holocaust gets going in, in earnest. Kazale and several other ones, uh, Josiah Wedgwood's another one, Adana Rathbone, uh, all great names, forgotten unfortunately, stood up against the mob and said, we as a society have got to do something. And Kazale urged the British government to allow refugees to come in, in almost an, uh, uh, um, without number into the UK, into Palestine, whichever country would take them. And of course, uh, he was, he was <coughs> pretty much ignored. Next slide, please. Um, this is from a, a magazine, um, American magazine called PM. Um, and it's from February the 3rd, 1943. And uh, two GIs are walking past a barbed wire fence. And behind the barbed wire fence is a very thin, uh, looking individual, a man, and there's a sign saying internment camp for Jews Casablanca. Uh, the tagline is, uh, I'm afraid I, I didn't manage to get it onto my screen, but the tagline there is one of the soldiers says to the other one, just for a moment I thought he was a cousin of mine. The story behind this cartoon is quite interesting. Uh, there were something like 300,000 Jews in North Africa. Uh, at the beginning of the war. North Africa, of course, became, a lot of it became under the jurisdiction of the Vichy French. The Vichy French were under the, the thumb of the Nazis. So what happened to the Jews of North Africa? Well, despite protestations by King Mohammed V of Morocco, many Jews were rounded up by the Vichy government and sent to not death camps, but to slave labor camps. One of them was in Casablanca. And when the Americans arrived, in the invasion force, they discovered these camps were still functioning. 
And that's what this cartoon's about. Uh, I could go on. Uh, North Africa is a very interesting area, but it's something we maybe do some other time. But it just goes to show how extensive the reach of the Holocaust and its anti Jewish policies were. Next slide, please. It's very easy to forget uh, that the people who were murdered um, in the Holocaust uh, were not born to be murdered and didn't expect themselves to become victims. And it's very good to remind ourselves that they were, again, normal human beings. Um, 11 million Jews, as we know, lived in Europe at the beginning of the war. In Germany, this is a really surprising statistic, they made up only 1% of the population. 1% tiny, tiny minority. Most Germans living in most of Germany would never have met a Jew, which again begs the question, where does this level of hatred come from? In Poland, there's a different story, 10% uh, of the population were Jewish. Little girl on the bottom left there who later becomes a victim of the Holocaust is happy because it's her first day at German school, about 1930, two or three years, four years later, should be kicked out of that school because Jews were not allowed to go to state schools uh, once Hitler had come to power. Next bit of the slide, please. These two little girls you can see on the right-hand side are two little Polish Jewish girls living in a small Polish town called Slonim in the east of Poland. This photograph was taken around about 1936. Uh, they're happy, they're well-fed, they're well-dressed. They, I always say to my students, they do not look like victims. They had no idea what was going to come to them. Um, they were, they did become victims. They didn't survive. Uh, they were, four, four years after this photograph were taken, uh, they were rounded up by um, killing squads and shot in the forests. It's a very uh, particular photograph for me because these two little girls are my wife's cousins. Uh, and this is a photograph we only discovered five or six years ago. Uh, before that, we knew nothing about them. Their memory had been completely wiped from family history. So I always do my little bit to remember them by putting them here. So can I have the next slide, please? OK. Trying to understand what was going on in the minds of people who murdered those little girls and people like them is not easy. But. Um, here is uh, a photograph taken on Carnival Day in a small German town in 1937. That little German town had a Jewish population of zero. Uh, what you can see here is a carnival float. I don't know whether you can make it out. Uh, the carnival float is called uh, Judenfresser, which if you're a German speaker you will know means the Jew eater. It's a Jew eating dragon and the townsfolk are queuing up to put on false noses. You can see them on the right hand side. Uh, they paid a, a mark or whatever it might be and the big laugh, the big humour is you take your children and you go inside as a Jew to be eaten up by the dragon and come out the other side. That's one very small um, glimpse into what was going on in the minds of people uh, in Nazi Germany as early as 1937. And so the question really comes um, these people who presumably were perfectly decent neighbours and friends, possibly um, nice people maybe, uh, a few years into Hitler's arrival can do something like this and think it's funny. So the next, next slide please. I also say to my students, uh, can you spot a Nazi? You know, there's a thing about them that makes them look particularly evil or uh, sinister. Uh, most people decide that the chap on the bottom, on the right-hand side, is, is must must be the Nazi because he looks, you know, pretty sinister. Uh, he, in fact, he was a Pole called uh, Leon Socha, who was a sewer worker in Lvov, and he personally risked his life for two years, saving Jewish families hiding in the sewers of Lvov and taking food and drink to them. It's an immense story. Actually, I think they're going to make a film of it because it's, uh, it's an amazing story. He was a rescuer. He'd been a thief and a burglar. He'd been arrested for uh, bodily harm. And yet, when the time came, he found it in himself to find some humanity. The man on the left-hand side is Reinhard Heydrich, 
he's carrying his little boy on his shoulder. Heydrich, the, the happy family man, is the architect of the gas chambers. He's the architect of the final solution. He was the chairman of the meeting at Vance when we saw that list being put together. And similarly, the, the, late, the woman at the top is a Nazi guard, Irma Gies, who was hanged by the British for war crimes. And the lady on the right, the old lady there, is another rescuer of up to 2,000 children in the Warsaw Ghetto in the 1940s. You can't tell by looking. You can tell, of course, by uniforms. Next slide, please. Um, and I, I, I show the students this photograph because I want them to say, I want them to realise that the Holocaust, the plans for the Holocaust was a joint effort. This could not, could not ever have been done by one man alone. This was not a Hitler pl a policy or plan. It was a collaborative event by hundreds, maybe thousands of senior figures, all very well educated uh, men, uh, some women. There's uh, Heydrich on the right there. The, the fatherly chap who had his child on his shoulders and uh, Joseph Goebbels on the left, the uh, leader of the propaganda unit of the Nazi party. Himmler there next to Hitler. Uh, Himmler was second in command of the, SS, of, the, of the Nazi party, head of the SS and the overall charge of the Holocaust. Next slide please. So what did the Nazi party stand for? This is a party like a political party. Its outline was in Mein Kampf, which uh, Hitler had uh, written in the 1920s, the book Mein Kampf. My, mein Kampf. I think it's important to know what they really stood for in order to grasp something about their motivations. So the first point please. So very importantly for the Nazis was the concept of race and race consciousness, a cult of the German race as being superior to any other race a blood, uh, a blood issue, that you were born superior or born inferior, and there was no way to go from one to the other. This was racial Darwinism, uh, which had been growing in the 1920s and reached its peak with Nazi philosophy. Next point, please. German expansion and settlement into Eastern Europe. Uh, I think a lot of, without preempting too much, but a lot of what Eric went through was an attempt by the Germans to clear Jews out of uh, areas of Poland, which had then become uh, land room for German settlement. So there was an element of uh, land grab in the Nazi policy. And then the next point, please. Uh, very much uh, Hitler, Hitlerite philosophy, a struggle against the eternal enemies of Germany. Germany cannot succeed in the Nazi world. Uh, because its eternal enemies, and who have been enemies for all time, uh, can, can, must be defeated, must be vanquished. And of course, principal of those enemies were the Jews. The Jews were our eternal enemies, and if they survive, any, even a small child survives, then it will threaten the survival of our superior master race. This was the kind of thinking, horrific, foreign, medieval, but nevertheless it was a policy bought hook, line and sinker by the majority of people, good people, like those people you saw queuing up in the Judenfresser, uh, as something that they could accept. It seemed to them to make sense. Next slide please. And in case you think uh, Nazi Europe, Nazi Germany was a land that had any kind of commonality with ours. Here is a poster from the 1930s. Um, and if I say to my students, what do you think this shows? And they say, well, it's, you know, that people can be of all races, can be friends, black and white, it makes no difference. Of course, you know from the context, this is a Nazi propaganda a poster. What it actually says is uh, the result, that's what uh, I think that word means, the result and the result of this friendship is racial purity threatened. In other words, don't do this. This is a no-no. Our racial superiority will be threatened if you make friends with other races. These posters were plastered all around Germany. Every town and village would have one. You would see one going to work. You would see it going to school. You would see it everywhere. In newspapers, on billboards, in shop windows. 
uh, the propaganda was relentless and unceasing, day in, day out. Next slide, please. And the result, of course, is that people bought in to this philosophy. And here a group of uh, Austrian uh, girls welcoming Hitler, who was coming to visit Vienna uh, sometime in 1938. Um, and it, they're like, like some pop star has come to town. Uh, they're welcoming him uh, into their arms, essentially. Next slide, please. So, we've got to ask ourselves a very important question now. Why were the Jews our eternal enemies? Why were the ones, they were the ones that were to be uh, assaulted in the way that the Nazis had planned? <coughs> so, first point, please. Of course, there'd been a history of anti-Jewish feeling in Europe for centuries. Anti-Semitism wasn't anything new. And in Germany, it worsened, really, since the rise of nationalism in the mid-19th century. There was a very, a very strong narrative, as there is, dare one say today, that if nationalism means I'm right, therefore you must be wrong. Who's in, who's out? Who's part of this new German nation? We are, of course, as Germans and Aryans. But the Jews, they're not really part of our new nation. And so Jews begin to be reviled and, and separated, but not in any way that they hadn't been before. Next point. In Mein Kampf, in the book that Hitler wrote, that Jews had been blamed for all the problems of Germany, but why wouldn't they be blamed? They are our eternal enemies, after all. They're blamed for the defeat and humiliation, particularly of the First World War. So all the suffering that Germans gone through, the, despite the fact that Jews in a higher proportion than the rest of the population volunteered to fight for Germany during the First World War, had the highest number per head of military iron crosses than anyone, despite all that, the rhetoric that they uh, had somehow betrayed Germany was bought uh, hook, line and sinker uh, by the population. Next slide, uh, next point, sorry. And then a conspiracy theory, my God, we think with the internet, don't we? that conspiracy theories are something new. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, the German propaganda machine before the internet uh, was fantastically efficient through radio, through film, through newspapers, uh, through speeches in your local park, whatever it might be. And the, uh, there was nothing like a good conspiracy theory to hold people together. And the narrative was very much the Jews were seeking to rule the world through two particularly Jewish tools, capitalism and Bolshevism or communism. They were responsible for both of these tools whose job it was to uh, bring dominance to the world because they were behind both. And this would prevent German racial dominance. Now, you, we can, I can looking at you now, I think there are some open mouths thinking, how can they be responsible for both? But again, these were th conspiracy ideas that were very easy for the population to swallow. When you're told it day in, day out, you start to believe it. <coughs> and next slide, next bit. Uh, the racial theory that, of course, uh, despite all this, uh, Jews were racially inferior and a threat to the success of the Aryan race. And then the final dot there. Uh, was it an attack on the Jewish religion? Were, they, were the Nazis upset with Jews because of the Old Testament or the religious beliefs or the, or, or, um, or the killing of Christ and so on? Uh, the answer, I think, the best answer I can give you is what Himmler himself was quoted as saying, that Jews were not a religion. This was a myth set out by the Jews to pretend they were a religion when in fact they were a world dominant uh, power. Um, the religion didn't come into it. If you were unreligious, non-religious, if you were very religious, if you were slightly religious, or if you were a Jew who had been baptized as a Christian, it made no difference. The only point was you were racially a Jew, and that's all that counted. Your religious beliefs did not come into it from a Nazi viewpoint. So, next slide, please. Uh, this is from uh, early on in the war. Um, it's a Jewish banker, of course, representing uh, capitalism, but he's hiding behind a curtain, as you can see. Uh, and in fact, the German says, hiding 
or behind um, the curtain is the Jew, and you can see there that there are uh, Germany's enemies, uh, Soviet Union, America, and Britain. But behind them, just in case you didn't know, the Jew's got his gold chain on, and he's dressed like in a stereotypical way as a sort of uh, capitalist. Uh, there were similar ones where the Jew behind the curtain was like a Bolshevik, a uh, snarling communist beast. Didn't make any difference depending on which propaganda you, you read. So this is the kind of stuff that was being fed to the average German day in, day out, uh, without any opposition, without any form of uh, censorship uh, the other way. So next slide, please. Okay, so very quickly, I'm kind of going to come to the end of what I'm going to say, because I think what when we look at the how the Nazis treated the Jews, it, I think is reflected very much in Eric's story. So the first point, uh, murder was murder uh, on a mass scale was one end of the Nazi plan. There were many other bits to it, and it's important to know about that, to understand his story. First of all, there was a policy to rob them all of all property and wealth, for the German economy needed their money, and these were subject people, subjugated people, so very easy to steal it from them, which is what happened. Next one, please. <coughs> then to round them up, uh, those who could work in slave labour camps and ghettos to produce goods for the German war effort. So uh, there was a policy to round up uh, m mostly um, uh, younger uh, women and men, uh, even older children, and their job would be to work until they died, essentially, until they died of starvation or beatings or whatever, to produce goods uh, for the German economy. And Lodge Ghetto is where Eric ends up at one point uh, in doing exactly this. Next point, please. Deportation and murder to make room for German-speaking Aryans. We've already talked about that, and that, of course, was done very brutally. Next point. And then from the summer of 1941, uh, the policy of mass murder to eliminate them completely from all of Europe. And finally, can I have a next point? Something that's not very well known, but it's certainly in Eric's story, and I wanted to give you the historical background to it. In April, May 1945, as the Allies advance, starved prisoners in Poland, those that have managed to survive, are marched or put in coal wagons to concentration camps in Germany, such as Belsen, Buchenwald and Theresienstadt. Those who survive that are lucky indeed because they had to march sometimes hundreds of miles in the freezing uh, snow uh, without shoes and with very little food. Um, so as you can see, the Holocaust is a highly, highly complex uh, set of uh, actions and policies. Can we have the next slide, please? <coughs> this is a, a rare photograph taken of child slave labour in the Lodge Ghetto. Lodge is a city in Poland. Uh, it was Part of it was walled off uh, to uh, imprison the Jews and enforce them into slave work. And you can see poor little children here having to push hugely heavy loads. Um, and also remember that they were given starvation diets of so maybe three to five hundred calories a day not expected to live very long. And there's a deportation in 44. The Germans decide enough is enough. We don't need any more of your uh, products. Uh, this is a deportation from the Lodge Ghetto. They're being deported to, uh, they don't know this yet, but they're, dep they're being deported to one of the death camps being set up uh, that had been set up, Auschwitz or Helno or uh, Treblinka, but probably Auschwitz. Um, so those people you see there are destined to die. And that's where they're heading. Um, the, one of the main death camps, not the only one, but they're certainly the largest, the one that we know of because we went there last year. Mass killings begin in 1942 after the Vansi conference that we talked about earlier. Uh, this is Heydrich's plan of mass killing on, a, on an industrial scale. Four gas chambers are in operation. And in summer 44, only a few months before the end of the war, is the peak uh, of the killing machine. In fact, those railway lines were put in to speed up uh, the process. <coughs> and uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is a very, again, very rare photograph of Jewish prisoners arriving at the death camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau. They've come off a cattle wagon train, possibly from Lodge, but actually in this case it's from Hungary. 
uh, and you can see they're having to wear the yellow star. Uh, women and children would mean because they had no use for them as slave labour, so they'd be dead, these women and children, within minutes of this photograph being uh, taken. <coughs> and the next slide, please. The selection process of Auschwitz-Birkenau, who was going to live and who was going to die. When I say live, that's live to be a slave labourer. And the next slide, please. And I wanted just to finish off with this one because um, this is a, a shoe, one of the <coughs> shoes of um, a child that was killed at Auschwitz-Birkenau. It's actually at the Imperial War Museum in London. Um, you see how tiny it is. And it just reminds us, again, that there was an owner of that shoe. There was a child whose foot fitted in the shoe. That shoe was taken with the child to Auschwitz-Birkenau, presumably because the parents of that child felt that the child and they had a future. They had no future. We can give them something of a future by remembering them, I think. And that's what part of our, our trip to Auschwitz, I think, helps to do. So it's a human story. It's not a horror story. And there's no finer way, no better way, I think, to hear a human story than to hear it from someone who was there, someone who witnessed it themselves, someone who went through many of the experiences that I've been talking about. To him, it wasn't Nazi policy. It was life. It was life and death. And so I'm going to stop now and introduce you to a great privilege to introduce you to Mr. Arik Hirsch. Good evening, everybody. I just tell you a little bit about my life story. I was born in Poland at the age of ten and a half. The Germans came in into Poland, and uh, ours was also a military, a military thing for the for the uh, Polish uh, artillery and so on. And um, life went on normally, and the gym is attacked, and um, we stopped going to school. And um, then, sorry, thank you very much. Um, they used to catch people for work, and I was caught on three occasions, and I was made to unload wagons of coal when the Germans came in and then they set up a Jewish committee and then they demanded men every day for work. And um, then in 1940, they, one night they came for my father. They were going to take, send him away to a camp. And he went with the police and um, during the night and he escaped then shouting at my mother and then they looked at my brother who was 14 years old and they took him and he escaped and then he was just screaming and shouting at my mother where's your husband where's your son he said you took him i haven't seen him and he looked at me and i was uh, nearly 11 years old, so uh, I wasn't uh, uh, capable of being sent to a camp. And um, at that time they said, take you, took you to a, a doctor to check you up if you fit. And the doctor sent me home and somebody from the committee says, his father escaped, his brother escaped, someone's got to go. And my, um, I did go. I went to the station and, uh, and my brother came and he said, you go home, I will change it with you. And he had a suitcase and so on. And I said, I was adamant I will go and he should go home. And um, our train was taken to um, a place called Otochna, uh, that's near uh, Poznan. And um, with the, uh, when we arrived, there were two SS men greeting us and they said to uh, leave your suitcases here at the station, we'll get it for you uh, after you get into the camp. And then we, they marched us off into the camp and um, 
as we arrived towards the gate of the camp, they started beating us with whips and sticks and it was murderous. And um, I got one or two hits as well, but that's life. And uh, they let us in into the camp and um, we never seen our suitcases again. Everything was, I don't know what they did with it. And um, then there were two and a half thousand men in the camp working on the, already for the attack on Russia, on, on the railway line for attack on Russia. And this what the workers worked on, to work on the railway line. And um, every day they were coming back and they were beaten and they were terrible. And they started hanging people. And um, our camp commander used to love to bring the rope to hang the people. And uh, also beating as well after work. And um, I was chosen to work in the kitchen and also bring water into the camp. On a big container, we pushed it. And um, then people started dying from the beatings and so on and I was made to bury the dead bodies. And four of us used to push a, a cart, and, um, and so uh, from day to day things were really bad, and um, I was the youngest in the camp, and then the camp commander um, called me one day and he said I will clo I will clean his office in his house. He lived on his own and I did that and he used to leave me some bread on the table which was wonderful. Uh, I knew it was for me because there was nobody else and then I ate it. Two days later he did the same and so on. And um, if after about 18 months, they, when the ra rail line was finished, they, um, there was about 11 people left out of two and a half thousand men. They beat them, they hung them, it was a horrendous place. And then nine were sent to another camp, and me and another boy, the camp commander sent home in 1942. Um, then I was 13 years old. When I got home to our town, people couldn't believe that somebody came back from a camp. And um, then women came asking me, how was my husband, how was my son? I said, everybody's working, everybody's all right. I never told them the truth. I never even told my mother the truth, what happened there. And um, <clears throat> then <coughs> I was at home two weeks. The um, liquidation of our ghetto went on. And we were marched, all the Jews were marched to the, a church. The church was done by nuns. And um, there were 4,000 people in a church and about twice as large as this room here and without any water, without any food, without any toilet facilities. Imagine 4,000 people in a, in a place without anything whatsoever. And suddenly the there were assessment outside, got me water right away and uh, they, as you went out they asked you what's your profession? I told him I was a tailor, but they sent me back in. Outside they picked about 150 people, and I knew that these people would definitely be going to work. And um, I went back into the church, and I've seen my, my, I spoke to my mother, but later on my father was take, caught and sent to another camp. And to this day I don't know where, where he was, but he never survived. And um, then 
we, as we uh, went into the church, I was very thirsty and asked my mother to get me a utensil, I would try and get some water. And um, so she gave me a utensil and I, as I walked towards the gate, the, uh, a German assessment shouted at me, what's your profession? I told him I was a tailor. This time he told me to, to go out and join the 150 people. We were taken to Lodge Ghetto, and um, I, I arrived there about 1942, and um, the 150 people were taken to the Lodge Ghetto, and when I got there, I was shocked to see barbed wire around the ghetto, policemen and assessment with guns guarding the place, got a shock over me. And then suddenly the Germans demanded uh, 10,000 children to bring forward 10,000 children up to the age of 14. And I was only 13. Uh, the parents would not hand over the children, so the assess came in themselves and went house by house, and eventually they did get the 10,000 children. I was hid, I hid myself on a cemetery. There was a small cemetery nearby. I hid and I was praying to God, let them not catch me. And they didn't. And eventually I went back into the building with the people which came from with 150 people. And um, we were in that building for a few days and uh, we got very, very little food. I didn't know what to do. I went out in the street on my own and I sat down on the corner and I started crying. I didn't know what to do. I was on my own. And the lady passed by and she says, why are you crying? And I told her that I was on my own. I came from that town. And um, she says, you'll come with me. And she took me by the hand and she took me in the house and um, she had a, a daughter, a small daughter, and I lived with them for a while and it wasn't the right thing for me. And um, then I met a, a boy who was in the orphanage. She says, why don't you come to the orphanage? Children our age group and so on. And I went and I was accepted and that was a bit better. And then I worked into a textile factory, um, uh, repairing machines, the, the <coughs> weaving machines, because I was learning as I went along. And uh, lunchtime we got some water to soup every lunchtime, and um, you got a small piece of bread in the morning, and that was our food for the day. We're starving all the, all the time. And so I went on, worked, where every day I worked to, I uh, went to work and I was in the ghetto for about two years. In 1944, the Germans said, we're liquidating the ghetto. Um, they even took some machinery with them to show that they're taking us to a, a place to work and um, on the wagons and they liquidated the whole ghetto of Jews. There were 160,000 Jews. And um, they took us on a journey. And when we stopped after about two days, we were 100 people in, a, in, a bar in, a, in the train, and uh, we couldn't even sit down. It was so cramped. And for a toilet, we had a bucket and a a um, blanket to cover and so on. And um, when I looked out, when the train stopped, I noticed some assessment, got me worried right away with dogs. And we've arrived actually in Auschwitz. Um, they said, boys and, and men together move forward, women and children on the other side, and we move forward 
and there were three high-ranking officers and they chose you go left or right. Uh, when you went left, you went to your death. When you went to the right, you went to, you went to work. We didn't know anything, but a mother, they wanted a mother, a young mother, she had a child on her arms, she wanted to take, they took the child away from her, she started screaming, and that, when the assessment ran towards her, I made a move and walked to the right side with the other men. And we walked on, and on the journey, some, of the, some men in striped suits said, you're on the right side. I didn't know right side, wrong side, and then we went into a building, a brick building, and they told us to take our clothes off. I had six photographs of my family, that's the last time I've ever seen what my family looked like. And we left everything on the floor, we went to the next room, they shaved our heads off, and then we had a shower. And after the shower, they took us into a room and we got our striped suits and we also received our Auschwitz number. B7608. I lost my name from that day onwards and they only called us by the number. We were only number. We had the same number on our on a piece of cloth on our jacket and also on our trousers. And um, then afterwards they took us into the gypsy camp. The gypsies about four days before that, they took them into the gas chamber and they killed them all off. And we took their barracks. We were, ten we were uh, a thousand people in a barrack sleeping on three bunks all the way down, ten people on a bed. Um, there was no mattresses, no cushions. Um, we slept in our clothing and for a, um, for a cushion we took our jacket off, wound it around our head and put it on the head. And then after that I was chosen to work in a a stone quarry, and after about four weeks, they decided to take the younger people to work on agriculture. Auschwitz was 30 kilometers big. It was a tremendous size camp. And um, we, uh, they took me to, uh, to work on agriculture with two horses, and um, I was plowing the fields, and for fertilizer they used to bring us in sacks ashes from the crematorium. When I used to throw it down on the floor, I could feel the bones in my hand. And um, I, I worked about three and a half months. I worked three and a half months uh, on agriculture, and then I was chosen to work on a fishing commander. We used to catch fish in the Vistula. And um, then we used to sort them out and send them off to Germany in tankers. And so I worked for about six months. And um, the winter came along very, very harsh, minus 32 degrees. And just being in a pyjama. Uh, and we were counted every morning for about an hour, sometimes for two hours with our hats off, we were sh our hairs were shaved off, and imagine no coat, and we had clogs on, and every morning and every night they used to count us. Sometimes an hour, sometimes two hours. People were freezing, and some of them died on the spot. We took the bodies away. Everything had to tally, even the dead bodies had to be counted in. And um, <clears throat> I was there till January 1945 in Auschwitz. And um, then one day we had artillery firing from a distance. The Russian army weren't, wasn't very far away. And the Germans decided to take us out 
I didn't know where, but we went on the death march. Why the death march? Anybody who couldn't walk was shot in the back of the head. There was a unit of assessment just shooting people as it went and used to throw the bodies on the side of the road. After two year, two hours, um, sorry, after two days walking, we came to a small station and you loaded on wagons, goods wagons, and after uh, we, about three days, without any food, without any water, and we arrived in near Weimar in a camp called Buchenwald. That was a vast camp as well. And they were making ammunition for the German army there. And um, we had the first shower in six months. Imagine, in Auschwitz, we only had one shower in six months. And there we had the first shower and they changed our clothing. And um, then after we, the shower does and everything, we, they put us in with the Russian prisons of war. Why the Russian prisons of war? Because they were not on the Geneva Convention, the Russian army. So they put them into barracks, into camps like us. Um, I was there for four days and somebody came, picked me out and took me to a children's barrack. There was one children's barrack in Buchenwald. And um, we had the same uniform done, but one thing, we had no more food, but we did not work in Buchenwald. For three months, we did, children we did not work. And um, one day, the 7th of, of April, uh, on the loudspeakers, saying all these um, barracks have got to come out, um, you're being transferred. And our barrack was included, and the masters up to Weimar, eight kilometers away. And when we got to Weimar, they started putting us on into open wagons, just no roofs. All the wagons were just open. And for a whole month, they shunted us around throughout Germany and Czechoslovakia. <coughs> uh, we very rarely get any, got any food. We had grass. I even took my shoe, I burned the leather and ate the leather. It was people dying every day on the trains. And we took, the, there were three wagons for dead bodies and we used to throw them out onto the, onto the wagon. And um, after a whole month, out of 3,000 men, 650 arrived in Czechoslovakia on the 4th of May, 1945. Our train was taken into a Theresienstadt. That was a ghetto for German Jews and Czech Jews. And four days later, on the 8th of May, I was liber liberated by the Russian army. On the 8th of May, the, the war was finished in Europe. And I did survive. I lost 80 people from my family, cousins, uncles, brothers, sisters, everybody. And um, then in August time, um, 1945, the British consul came, looked us children over, and they put us into three buildings. Then on the 14th of August, 1945, they took us to Prague, the capital of Czechoslovakia. They, then we went to the airport, and they waited for us, 10 Lancaster bombers, and they loaded 30 children to a bomber, 15 on one side and 15 on the other. And um, they, took a, they brought us to England. 300 children, 40 girls and 260 boys. And they brought us to the Lake District. Outside Windermere was a factory making aeroplanes. And the war was finished already, so people went home. And we took our, their 
houses and uh, all the living accommodation. And um, we were there for six months. We had seven hours of English lessons, that's all we had. And um, after six months, they distributed us to different towns. I went to Liverpool with 20 boys. Uh, Manchester took 30, London took 120, Glasgow took some, and so on. And that's how we were distributed. And that's how I came to England. And um, we had no parents, we had no family, we had nobody. And um, then uh, we lived in hostels. It wasn't easy for us, it was a difficult time. We never spoke the language, we, we, had, we lost our education and everything. But somehow I made a life, I got married, I had three children, I got seven grandchildren, and somehow I made a life and um, I enjoy England today and um, everything is okay as far as that's concerned. So thank you very much and now I would like to ask you any questions? I assume that you must have been giving must have been giving these sorts of talks hundreds of times, probably over the years. And I just wonder that you're never allowed to forget what you went through because you're reliving it all the time as you deliver talks like this. I just wonder whether it's something that you feel that you need to do, or you have a responsibility to do so, or about when did I start to talk? Uh, 1995, when they opened the first Holocaust Museum by a Christian family in Nottinghamshire. The two brothers came to me and said, uh, we're opening a Holocaust Museum, would you come and talk? And I hesitated. And um, then I started writing my book, A Detail of History. And um, I went actually to the Holocaust Museum and I've been, over the years, I've been giving talks to schools, universities, um, and I go on trips to Poland and so on, and um, I never give up. I carry on, I go March of the Living, and I also go with school young people as well to Auschwitz and so on, show them the place and explaining to them all the, all the details about it. Up to 1995, I never talked about it. Never even told my children or my wife, nothing. Because I, I had about 30 years of terrible dreams during the night. I used to wake up scared and nervous and so on. But it left me, thank goodness for that. I've lost 80 people from my family, cousins, uncles, everybody. And they were actually taken to Helmno, a cutout in a forest, where 365,000 people are buried in three mass graves. They got them first, and then they buried them in three mass graves. I've been back quite often to say a prayer over the graves, that's all I can do. Uh, as we discussed at the start, um, obviously it was a much bigger thing than just a group of Nazis that put this together. Did, have you been able to, or did you struggle to come to terms and sort of forgive the tertiary characters in, in all of this? Obviously the people that built the railways, the people that, you know, that sort of put the infrastructure in place. Uh, I would never forgive the Germans from who were there during the war. As a matter of fact, um, I took a group to Auschwitz and uh, on the way back, an English lady said to me, I'm teaching in a school in Germany. Would you come and talk to, to my children? Uh, I said, no. She phoned me, she wrote to me and so on. After a few months, I gave in. And I've been going back to Buchenwald, it's where I've been before, in a camp. It's still shown as a camp. <coughs> and um, the, fo 
I meet about 120 German students and the following day I go back to the school, they watch my film and then they ask questions. And they don't beat around the bush, uh, they, I tell them my story and so on and they have the head down and um, they know the grandparents who did it. I don't blame them for it, but the grandparents did it. And most of them died na out now, so it's a matter of now just Germany is now an ordinary uh, country and it's got a, a mixture of people, all sorts of people. I would like to ask you about have you got any memories about the Sonder Commandos rebellion in October 1944 as you were in the gypsy camp and you were not far away from the northern crematoria? I was nearby. Please. I was nearby on the 7th of October 1944. It happened. Uh, a siren went off and they blew up crematorium 4 and they escaped. They killed, I think, three, four German uh, assessmen. And they escaped. And eventually, the um, assessmen chased them. They caught them, and they shot all of them, unfortunately. Yes, I remember the day, the 7th of October, 1944. It was a nice, beautiful day at that time. And the siren went off, and um, the whole situation happened. But uh, <laughs> I, I was near the Santa Commando. Um, I used to see. We didn't talk to them, but they were fenced off in a, in a different area. Uh, but I used to see them walking and, and talking to each other. Every three months, I used to kill them off and take some more other people to, to burn the people. Have you ever met any of your captors after the war? Oh no, I didn't. I wouldn't like to, because I would have done something to them. <laughs> uh, no, I never met one. Do you feel like movies like The Boy in the Spike Pajamas, which are not quite romanticised, but quite falsified in how they portray the narrative, do you find those movies to be helpful or hurtful in terms of helping people understand what happened? Uh, no, the I've seen the boy uh, in striped pajamas. <coughs> that would have never happened. The G a German boy would actually go into the gas chambers. And so no, that would have. It was a film made to to show basically what what happened. But uh, no, no German boy or the camp commander's son would ever uh, be gassed. And no, no, no way. So do you think that as a reference point for many children and adults in this day and age sort of hurts the lessons that we should be drawing from what happened? Uh, certainly. Um, schools are taught and uh, many people are taught about it. And uh, I go around to schools, universities, and I talk in Bet Shalom and uh, many, many places. And um, I tell the people actually what happened. And um, where did all my family disappear? They're all killed. And um, I used to have nightmares after the war. I used to have terrible nightmares. And, um, and now things are slowly, slowly um, leaving me, all the nightmares and so on. But it was a hor horrendous time I had. Mr. Hirsch, uh, you've seen the very worst of... <laughs> the very worst of human nature, but you must have seen the best of human nature amongst your fellow Jewish prisoners. There must have been situations which were dangerous and where, where your fellow Jew was stealing a potato here or a turnip there just to feed people who, who, who needed food. Which of the two sides of human nature has affected you most? 
Have you been affected by the, the, the bad side of human nature? Or has the good side <coughs> encouraged you about civil, uh, civilization? Um, I've always been a kind person by nature. Um, I've got a lot of friends and a lot of, uh, I know a lot of people. Um, I've even been called to the palace, I've got an MBE and I've had lunch with the Queen and, uh, and um, life is, I hope life is for living and uh, you must get on with life and so on. I can't turn the pages back now. It's an impossibility. I know I would never see nobody for my family and so on. And um, so I accepted now my life the way it is. Um. Eric, there was another film called Sophie's Choice. Was that true? Sophie's <coughs> Choice. Yeah. Um. A mother who has to decide the commandant is prepared to save one child and she has to decide whether she wants the boy or the girl. Have you seen that film? No, I didn't. By Meryl Streep? No, I didn't. I didn't see I that I just one. wanted to know whether that was true or no, not. No, no. It happened in Auschwitz. Yeah. i never seen that uh, film, so I, I couldn't g give you the answer to it. Would that be a, and do you think it's true that a German officer would have uh, saved one child, so another one? No way. Uh, no way. They were barbaric, they were inhuman, they, they were not people what you see today, normal people. Uh, the camp commander of Auschwitz had four children. He used to take them out to play games and everything, just on the side of the wires, of the wire fence. He lived a normal life. And, and at the same time, millions of people were dying in the crematoriums and in, in gas chambers. And he used to take him swimming, he used to take him just a normal life he lived there. They caught him after the war, the British caught him and they hanged him. I would like to know, to know which is your opinion about the human being after your very hard experience. Thank you. What's your opinion about human beings after all your experience? <laughs> Not everybody is bad. You get some very good, I met some very good human beings. And um, I'm, a pe I'm a bit pessimistic as far as that's concerned. I love human beings, I love people, and I love to talk to people and so on. But I don't see anybody today as bad as the Nazis were. No, but never would I, I hope I never see that again. And I believe in democracy, and I believe in all the wonderful things we have today. And life goes on. <coughs> you, endo you endured a lot of pain, and you went through a lot of atrocities yourself. What would you say, you, and I feel that is quite admirable, the fact that your faith in God, you held on to that. And um, did you feel that there were other people who um, held um held the faith in such a way that that went, made them see, um, maybe a, a feel that they had hope? Um, I did hope all the war that I would survive. Um, yes, I, I said a prayer from time to time, not every day, because in our you couldn't pray. And um, I was hoping that I will survive, and somehow I did. Did you pray for your enemies, maybe for a change of heart? Would you pray also for your enemies, did for a change of heart? Your, that your enemies would have a change of heart? Did you ever pray that the Germans would change? Um, no, I never prayed as far as that concerned, because I, I knew nobody would listen to me. And, um, but I prayed from time to time and I was hoping that I would survive and um, to let me live. Uh, 
when I arrived in Auschwitz, when I before, when I got the number and everything, and they asked me my age. They kept records of the people that they chose to live. They had a record. Your name, what's your profession, and how old you are. I told them I was 17, but I was only 14 in 1944. And I told them I was a locksmith. If they would have asked me to repair something or whatever, I couldn't do it. But I said, I've learned in my first camp what to say, how to try and wiggle yourself out <coughs> to, from one place to the other. And it worked. Somehow for me it worked. So I told them untruth, but in the end I, I got out. I just wanted to ask if you saw, if you ever saw a softer side to the gods or any compassion towards you, or they were all harsh and hateful and working under, um, under their superiors. Did you ever see any softer side to the gods? <coughs> the gods? No. None of them? None. Ever? No. I, I remember on a Sunday, I stood... Auschwitz, they, the wires were not electrified during the day. Night time they were. And one day I stood, Sunday we didn't work, the only day we didn't work. And uh, suddenly a guard is walking with an Alsatian dog, just slowly, slowly <coughs> passing by, and he eats some food from a, um, a bit of a utensil. And he stopped. I just stood with my head down. He says, are you hungry? I shook my head. I couldn't even tell him that. I shook my head, yes. He came over to the, the wire. He stretched his hand out with the utensil. And he threw it down for the dog to look it up for the Alsatian. How cruel can you be with that? That has always stood out in my mind. I never met one bit of a decency of the guards, not one. They were savage, they were inhuman, they were horrendous. Uh, Mr. Hirsch, uh, um, you've just said uh, possibly the the worst thing I've heard that Auschwitz is a is a place where you cannot pray. So, what I would like to ask you is, um, what keeps a man going in a place where you cannot pray? That you cannot pray. What, what keeps, keeps you, you going? You said earlier you, you couldn't pray in Auschwitz. No. So my question is. If you are somewhere where you cannot pray, where do you find the strength to keep going? I wanted to live. That was my first option. Every day I was looking up to heaven and praying, maybe, maybe we'll survive. We knew what was going on. The Trains were coming with people, thousands and thousands, and the crematoriums were going, gas chambers, the crematorium, going day and night. And I sometimes looked up to heaven and, and say certain words. And somehow for me, it worked. Every day they used to take out people on a cart dead bodies, people died from starvation and so on, and they should take them out, dead bodies, 10, 15, in the, into the crematorium. And um, you used to see it every day. And what could I do? Nothing. Um, in the morning, we went to the bathroom. The bathroom were concrete, and there were about 40 holes on concrete, 
in the winter think you got to sit on concrete and there were five buckets of water we dipped our hands in the water just washed our eyes that's all you could do you didn't have a towel you didn't have nothing you didn't have any soap nothing but somehow I've made I don't know to this day how I made it but I did Um, when you, um, on, like, holidays, did you ever, but did the gods make life harder on holidays, like Hanukkah and all that? We didn't know any holidays, any days whatsoever. No. Uh, we lost our, our, cal uh, we didn't have a calendar. You thought, from time to time, you used to get to know what day it is. But normally, we had nothing, no. We didn't pray, we couldn't, sometimes used to pray, said a few words, but that's about it. But you couldn't, you know, had nothing. You were just a slave, and they made you work, and they tortured you, and did everything possible. And the beating, from time to time, we had to watch people being beaten, and uh, also hanged. Uh, for just anything, they used to hang them. We had to stand around in a square watching how the people are being hanged. And you couldn't... I've seen people hang just try... Uh, I remember three people tried to escape. They caught them. Ours was 30 kilometers big. It was a vast, vast camp. And um, they brought them back. And we had to stand around in a square and watch them, how they were hanged. And they, two of them shouted, death to Hitler, death to the Germans, you're losing the war, and you'll all die, and all sorts of different things. So the assessment just kicked the, the chair away, and they dropped, and so on. And that, uh, so I've seen so many people hanged, so many people beaten to death, and so on. I should have never seen that as a, as a young child, <coughs> I came out, I was 15 years old. I went through hell. I made myself older all the time. And that's why I'm here today. As one of the few survivors, do you ever feel guilty or say to yourself, why me? No, I'm not. I lost 80 of my family, cousins, uncles, everybody, brothers, sisters. Why should I feel anything bad that I survived? No, I don't. I j I'm just the opposite. I don't feel any guilt whatsoever. It was my luck. It's just luck that I actually did survive. Your Concentration camp number. Why have you never had it removed? Um, <laughs> I was thinking at one time to have it removed. Then I met two of my friends from London. And they tried, a girl and a boy, they tried to have it removed. And the mess it left them with, I decided against it. I have nothing to be ashamed of. The Jamies should be ashamed of, not me.